Today, she will speak about creating pathways of perspective shifting through structured critical reflection. Please help me welcome Dr. Crane. Thank you so much for this lovely introduction, Angelica, and for the invitation to be here. It is um, a true delight to be back here at Cornell. Um, you can see the 94. Um, I'm, I'm outing my age, but, uh, but uh, that's to signify, of course, that I did my undergraduate studies here at Cornell. So it's really exciting to be back here to see familiar faces. Um, and particularly to see people who've had such an important impact on my education and professional trajectory. Um, so I'm really delighted to be here with you all to talk about work that I've been doing on critical reflection within language education. And as you'll soon hear, I'll be situating this work within a very specific educational framework, namely transformative, sometimes called transformational learning. Um, this is an adult learning theory that seeks to understand the, the conditions by which individuals expand and transform their perspectives about the world and themselves. I'll have more to say about this process shortly, especially in terms of how it connects to language education. But for now, I hope you will indulge me briefly as I reflect back on my own transformative experience at Cornell when I was an undergraduate here. And yes, I do have a few pictures to share. <laughs> These are pictures I took. Um, they're pictures of pictures with my phone, <laughs> so I apologize for the quality. It's probably not particularly nice uh, on Zoom. Um, so in the 1990s, Cornell had a dynamic study abroad program in Hamburg, Germany. The opportunity to study abroad was one of the reasons why I applied to Cornell. And in 1992, just a few years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, I joined a small group of students to study at the University of Hamburg. This year-long study abroad experience did what study abroad is supposed to do. It challenged me in small and big ways, intellectually, emotionally, maybe even physically, though I think Live Slope prepared me fairly well for the city walking and the occasional hiking and biking trips that we took. Um, it's of course uh, a cliche to say this, but the experience introduced me to new ways of thinking about the world and myself as it forced me to re-examine some of my belief systems and to begin to consider where these ideas even came from. Looking back on my education in Hamburg, I know my time there was transformative for many reasons, not only due to the experience of living in another culture um, and speaking a second language in that culture, but also because of the great care that our director, Dr. Juan Arroyo, um, took in supporting students in the program as a whole. In transformative learning terms, the Cornell and Hamburg program offered, quote, high challenge accompanied by, quote, high support providing just the right environment for us students to process our experiences and feel as if we were changing in significant ways. A key factor in the perspective transformation process is having the opportunity to critically reflect on one's experience. But what do we mean by critical reflection exactly and what can it look like? These are some of the questions that I'd like to explore with you today within the context of language education. We know from scholarship on transformative language learning that providing second language learners with space and guidance to critically reflect on their past and current learning experiences can set them up to better understand and evolve their own worldviews as they're learning about and engaging with ones very different from their own. But while reflection is often acknowledged as playing an important role in leading language pedagogies, it's rarely theorized from a pedagogical perspective, let alone integrated into formal language assessment. So with reflective practice and language instruction having become more mainstream, it's important that educators are able to understand the diverse outcomes associated with different reflection activities and the learning conditions and instructional scaffolding needed to support students' ability, hello, to critically reflect on their learning. As Ashen Clayton 2009 note, quote, a critical reflection process that generates, deepens, and documents learning does not occur automatically. Rather, it must be carefully and intentionally designed. In my talk today, I'll attempt to address what we mean by critical reflection and what educators see as the main benefits of integrating reflection activities into their instructional practice. In the second half, I'll provide some examples of critical reflection from my own practice that I've used in beginning, intermediate, and advanced German language instruction to illustrate how reflective practice can be staged meaningfully across a curriculum to support level-specific learning and cultivate a practice of reflection among learners and teachers. So to begin, 
great, it's working. <laughs> to begin, it's worth noting how widespread the practice of reflection is across so many leading approaches to teaching and learning languages. Um, and I'm sure I'm forgetting a few here, but these are the ones that, that really have, have struck me in my reading and uh, my teaching work. So we know that reflection is a key part of critical pedagogy and social justice work where individuals are encouraged to explore issues of power within particular communities. It's an explicit part of multiliteracies and genre pedagogies where, for example, language users are asked to reflect on how and why texts exhibit particular forms. Reflection is also considered essential for the success of social pedagogies, game-based learning, and global simulations where learning experiences, sometimes creating dissonance for the learner, need to be processed. And it plays a central role in high impact practices beyond the traditional classroom walls, such as in community engaged language learning and study abroad. Yet despite its pervasiveness, reflection can easily become a fuzzy concept and a catch all for different practices that involve making meaning out of experience. Um, here it can be instructive to look to educational scholarship for learning, for insight. Russell Rogers 2001 Critical Analysis of Reflection Approaches identifies seven theoretical approaches to reflection widely cited in educational research. These include reflective learning, reflective thinking, metacognitive reflection, reflection and action as contrasted with reflection on action, and critical reflection among others. In reviewing these approaches, Rogers notes several features of reflection common in their definitions. He writes, these commonalities include reflection as a cognitive and affective process or activity that number one, requires active engagement on the part of the individual. Two, is triggered by an unusual or perplexing situation or experience. Three, involves examining one's responses, beliefs and premises in light of the situation at hand. And four, results in integration of the new understanding into one's experience. Roger's observation reflects a common understanding within the field that the term reflection refers to two qualitatively different things. On the one hand, it's a cognitive process, and on the other, it's a structured learning activity. We know that experience alone does not lead to learning, rather contemplation of experience is needed, and that, and that appears to be best facilitated through guided or structured reflection in which individuals are nudged to examine and question their assumptions. Oh, sorry, this is where we should be. Okay. An early developmental view on reflection work comes from Hatton and Smith, 1995, who studied the types of reflection that teacher education candidates produced in their coursework. They observed four levels of reflective writing, descriptive writing, descriptive reflection, dialogic reflection, and critical reflection. Um, and this typology illustrates a progression of writing from pure description without discussion or any sort of evidence of reflection to increasingly greater reflection that takes into account, um, it takes into account context and multiple perspectives. That's the end here with the critical reflection. Indeed, rich description, um, I'm sorry, pardon me, though their, metal, their model might initially appear to downplay description the authors acknowledge that description plays an important role in providing evidence-based reflection. Indeed, rich description is one of the more co common defining features of successful reflections. And for some educators, including Grossman 2009, detailed description illustrates and supports, um, that, that illustrates and supports one's ideas serves as the sole criterion in evaluating certain types of reflective work. So in his 2009 article on how to structure and scaffold reflection for college learners, Robert Grossman identifies four major types of reflection common in educational practice that can be used to support students' development. The first is content-based reflection, which is the reflection most often seen in instructed learning, included, um, including service learning scholarship. This type of reflection is aligned to particular content, such as course concepts, principles, and ideas. And it, it's often asking of students to connect the content to their lives with the goal of strengthening and deepening learning. Metacognitive reflection involves reflection on one's own thinking or emotions and can involve helping students to disambiguate between the two. And self-authorship reflection is interested in how individuals move from, quote, accepting knowledge from authorities to, quote, constructing knowledge for oneself. 
when students aren't asked to reflect on their values and beliefs, including importantly the sources of those beliefs, then they're at risk of relying on external authority to make sense of their experiences. This connects to a fourth type of reflection identified by Grossman, namely transformative or intensive reflection in which individuals reflect on the very premise of their assumptions and beliefs, the complex why questions. Grossman's last um, reflection type, transformative or intensive reflection, um, draws on typology from the adult learning model of transformative learning that sees critical reflection as exhibiting characteristics across three key sub-reflection types. The first content reflection focuses on particular content material and has the goal of developing learners' awareness of their assumptions surrounding the content that they're learning. And you can see some questions here. This is from Crant in 2016 or 2016 um, that shows um, the sorts of questions that we might use to get at, um, at students' um, understanding of content. The second is called process reflection, and here it asks individuals to identify and explain the processes by which they come to understand something. In other words, this sort of reflection asks them to consider the source of their assumptions. And the final one, premise reflection, represents a type of full perspective transformation where one shifts one frames, one's frame of reference. Crant in 2016 distinguishes premise reflection from um, from content and process reflection in the following way, quote, she writes, content and process reflection may lead to the transformation of a specific belief, but it's premise reflection that engages learners in seeing themselves and the world in a different way. And one of the things I really like about the questions that you see here too, is that you have a lot of what questions, then they lead to the how questions. And if I go back, you see the why questions, right? All of these are part of critical reflection. So a final point about reflection work, particularly in light of its potential for perspective transformation. Featherston and Kelly's research shows uh, from 20, uh, 2007 show that reflection work, especially when it involves re-examination of one's core beliefs and values can be highly emotional. Individuals may be grieving for their old assumptions and old ways of thinking that no longer fit in their current frames of reference. Additionally, doing reflection can be a new experience for many students and for teachers as well, and it's not uncommon for some students to resist participating in reflection. Additionally, some may need considerable time to lower their resistance. So before I talk about critical reflection in the language classroom, I'd like to briefly highlight some key features of transformative learning theory that can help answer the question as to why this developmental lens may be especially fruitful for language education. Um, I'd like to begin with a definition, this coming from uh, Jack Mesereau, 2000. Um, and I've highlighted some key features here to draw your attention to things that I think are really unique and um, set it apart perhaps from other um, similar uh, constructs that we use in language education to understand this, this phenomenon. So Mesereau defines transformative learning as, quote, the process by which we transform our taken for granted frames of reference to make them more inclusive, discriminating, open, emotionally capable of change, and reflective so that they may generate beliefs and opinions that will prove more true or justified to guide action. In the process of transforming one's perspective, the individual becomes aware of their own frames of reference, that is their own worldviews, the way the filters that they use to understand the world. And these frames of reference often contain assumptions about the world that are previously taken for granted. So all of this is hidden, that's why it's so difficult to do. Um, it's important to point out that this process of perspective transformation is concerned not just with changing one's mind or adopting another position, but rather it's, it's concerned with developing increasing open-mindedness so as to hold multiple perspectives that feel true to the individual and which may also lead the individual to uh, make changes in their behavior. So transformative learning is concerned with um, changes in individuals' frames of reference or in Mesereau's terms, meaning perspectives. Um, these represent a quote, web of assumptions and expectations through which we filter the world that we see, or through which we um, filter the world we see, the, through which we filter the world we see. 
Mesro is taking here, talking here about deep structural changes in the ways that we make sense of the world. These frames of reference represent on the one hand, changes in our meaning structures, um, what Patricia Cranton describes as quote, broad dispositions that we use to interpret experience, but they also include smaller meaning schemes that make up these broad dispositions and that represent the quote, habitual implicit rules for interpreting experiences. Unless we engage our perceptions critically through, for example, reflection or dialogue with others, we invariably filter new experiences that come our way through our familiar frames of reference. As Taylor and Elias 2012 explain, a transformative learning lens um, views development in terms of knowing differently. I think this is really helpful to think about the word differently. They state, quote, we do not merely gain knowledge and experience as we mature. That's the informational explanation for change and growth. But we also know in a different way. That's the transformational explanation for growth. So you can see here why this is also seen as an adult learning theory and not something that we see, for example, um, with, with um, younger learners. So at the center of uh, transformative learning is the disorienting dilemma. You may have heard about this before. It's a difficult, often discordant encounter that serves as the catalyst for individuals to question their current values and worldviews. Through a series of events that follow involving critical reflection, as I've discussed already, dialogue with others, which can take on a, should take on a critical um, aspect as well, and through intended and actual actions, these dilemmas can lead one to re-examine existing assumptions and thereby expand and alter one's frame of reference. It's important to keep in mind with transformative learning pedagogies designed to support perspective shifting, that it's unlikely um, that students will experience full perspective transformation through a pedagogical intervention, a course, or even over a curricular sequence. But there are aspects of perspective transformation, what we might call small T transformations, that one can identify in students' reflective work, making partial transformations in certain attitudes and ways of thinking a more realistic goal for educators. And I'd be happy to talk more about that if, if people are interested. Because transformative learning is concerned with the conditions that lead individuals to change their perspectives about the world and themselves, it can provide language teachers with a helpful lens for understanding one of the most important aspects of learning another language, namely the ability to operate between languages, mediate cultures, uh, and hold multiple perspectives. So let's now turn to practical applications of structured reflection to see how transformative learning theory and especially the role of critical reflection can be enacted within a collegiate language curriculum. So for this section, I'll be drawing on work that Mike Sosolsky from Washington College and I've developed over the past 10 years and which has appeared in um, some recent publications on transformative language learning. And in our work, um, Mike and I draw on Anderson and Cunningham's 2010 Structured Reflection Triangle for understanding how transformations in perspective can be facilitated through reflection. In the model, reflection is designed with the goal of having students connect three domains of knowing to each other. Um, the assumptions and beliefs that they have, often not immediately visible to them. This relates to the, as you can see at the top here, the understanding of the self. Um, theoretical and conceptual knowledge and experiences encountered outside of instruction. That's to the right down here. Um, and uh, uh, theoretical, sorry, theoretical and conceptual knowledge related to course goals and content that's to the left and then experiences encountered outside of the instruction that is to the right here. A reflection would then guide students to consider moments when different understandings are similar or when they contrast or even conf conflict, thereby helping learners to identify and describe the cognitive dissonance and then question the source of their assumptions. So these little T's, these little T transformations of, of beliefs um, that can happen through um, examining different domains of understanding um, and hopefully lead to a larger perspective transformation when all of these are engaged. What should the focus of students' reflections be? Well, Hatcher and Bringle's 1997 definition of reflection is, quote, the intentional consideration of an experience in light of particular learning objectives um, can, can be a start. Mike and I suggest looking to um, a course's core learning goals, um, drawing on this definition here. As you can see here, different courses at different curricular levels. This comes from uh, a curriculum that I was working um, in some years ago. 
um, we had a beginning, I was overseeing the beginning German classes and the intermediate German classes, and then also teaching a low advanced German class. Um, and we use structured reflection in all of these. So as you can see here, different courses at different curricular levels connect to key thematic strands or larger learning goals of the instructional level. So a first semester course had as its reflective focus, what does it mean to learn German? An intermediate course where students were working with a book that exposed learners to different regional cultures in the German speaking world had students explore the notion of German culture, especially German city culture. And in the low advanced German course, students developed and explored their own puzzles about German grammar by engaging with the reflective practitioner research model of exploratory practice. So allow me to now show how multiple interconnected guided reflection opportunities can guide language learners to engage their frames of reference. So the prompts here um, come from a first semester German course. Uh, this is originally from fall 2014. Um, some of these are still being used um, and some of them have been adapted. But coming from a large state university, over the course of the semester, students responded in English to four prompts, with each prompt eliciting a one-page written reflection. The four prompts, as you can see here, had students first articulate their assumptions and how these assumptions were formed, then interrogate these assumptions vis-a-vis -vis their ongoing learning, next probe how German fit into their wider educational goals and values, and finally assess their learning over the semester, including any perceived shifts in viewpoint. And together, the prompts in this beginning course set up space for ongoing reflection about what German is, how one learns German, and what German means to the students personally. So they were going back to, uh, to the original journals through this dialogic process. Similarly, for the intermediate course in which students learn about German regional culture, four prompts allowed students to engage their previous assumptions. So you see we have the same type of journal, what are your assumptions about German culture, specifically German city culture? But there's an added layer of complexity in the following, um, the subsequent journals. So you, you can see the second and third prompts had students try on different theoretical models for understanding intercultural experiences. In the second prompt, students worked with Hall's 1976 popular anthropological framework, Culture is an Iceberg. You might know that where, um, where you can only see or only one ninth of or one eighth of an iceberg is visible to um, uh, to people the naked eye, um, and uh, that's right. So this framework, the culture is an iceberg, suggests that much of what constitutes culture, attitudes, core values, assumptions is hidden uh, from the naked eye. And while a third um, prompt had students consider their learning through the lens of Michael Byram's 1997 model of intercultural competence, specifically engaging with the distinction between tourist and sojourner. So what were their experiences like in terms of that model? So within these and other courses across the curriculum, the prompts encourage students to reflect in a continuous linked way by returning to and dialoguing with their previous reflections. So we're gonna go up the curriculum. Um, in spring 2019, I collected and analyzed structured reflection data from an upper level course on German sociolinguistics that I taught entitled Sociolinguistic Landscapes, German Language, Society and Identity. It was a really fun course to teach. Um, it was conducted in German. The structured reflections were also written in German. And this advanced level seminar introduced students to sociocultural aspects of German language variation by exploring how social and community identities are constructed and shaped through language. The seminar consisted of four larger thematic units, each addressing the German speaking world from different angles. And you can see them uh, listed here. So the first one focused on defining the German language. Then we looked at regional variation, including a historical overview of the language. Um, we then focused on the role of migration on language change and policy, and then ended up talking about the relationship um, between various social variables, age, gender, social distance, and language. The overarching questions explored in the course included, what is the German language? Who are its speakers? And how do speakers of different varieties of German relate to each other? How has German evolved? How does it continue to develop? And what factors impact its development? And finally, how have institutions responded to increasingly culturally and linguistically diverse populations in the German speaking world? So these are really heavy, essential questions that, that guided this course. 
So to help students develop understanding of the role of language variation and the impact of language change on human personal experience in the German speaking world, the course drew in a range of text types, including some outside the field of linguistics. In addition to reading book chapters and journal articles from German sociolinguistic scholarship, students regularly engaged with artistic sources such as literature, film, and music, as well as current news media. This unique combination of text was considered an engaging and developmentally friendly way to familiarize students with more densely written academic texts in an L2. Indeed, as a course situated within a collegiate language department that foregrounded literature and film, the seminar provided explicit language scaffolding to support advanced L2 learners' academic literacy abilities across different modalities, academic reading, presentational speaking, and reflective writing. I'm coming to the structured reflection part now. So reflecting a commitment um, to help students learn and reflect on the, co the content material as well as develop in their discursive abilities in German, because remember they're writing these reflections in German, students were required to complete four written structured reflections, each with um, a second draft. And it constituted 30% of the, the entire grade. So this slide shows the four reflection prompts that sought to develop students' critical awareness of language issues. As you can see, students were expected to critically reflect on the construct of linguistic variation in German-speaking contexts from different perspectives, spatial, chronological, and social, and interrogate their own assumptions about the German language and reflect on the relationship between language, society, and identity in light of course readings. So allow me now to share a few examples from the students' reflections that show features of transformative learning in them. The first pertains to the notion of disorienting dilemmas that I talked about before. This is the catalyst, right, for perspective transformation. And this is something that emerged in Rebecca pseudonym in Rebecca's first reflection that asked students to describe their understanding of linguistic variation and try to connect their understanding to their own lived experiences. They had already done a little bit of reading in the, in the class at that point, but it was pretty soon after starting the class when, I think it was maybe week three when, when they wrote these. So in her reflection, um, Rebecca reflected on a disorienting experience from high school when her German host family spoke to her in Frank Conian, a German dialect that she had not heard of before and had not been exposed to in school. Do you know Franconian? I might have you read the opening here. That one I did not translate. <laughs> Give me one minute. So here, Rebecca reflects on her personal relationship to linguistic variation, focusing on moments of miscommunication. And this was a much longer reflection. Um, this is an English translation. Um, if you're interested, I'm happy to share with you the German translation, um, not on slides, but but uh, after the talk. Um, and she begins I, uh, begins with um, language in Franconian. Angelica, would you like to hate I mean, to put you I, on can, the spot. I can say Swabian. Oh, um, even better. <laughs> in Swabian, it would be Willst du a wenig wurscht, Rebecca? Wird selbst a wenig ham vielleicht mit a bottle cola? Ja, passt <laughs> I thought it was pretty good. Yes. We're okay. 10 minutes. Great. Okay. Excellent. So, um, so let's read, we'll just read the, the parts in blue because there's a lot of text here. So she writes, um, I still remember how clammy my hands became and how red my face appeared when I realized that I could not understand those words. Actually, I'm going to read the whole thing, but quickly. I was 15 and had just arrived in Kulmbach, Germany, Kulmbach, Germany for a summer cultural exchange. At the kitchen table for my first meal with my host mother, it became embarrassingly obvious that she was not speaking a variety of the German I had learned at school. Instead, she spoke Franconian, a Bavarian dialect that served as my introduction to linguistic variation in German-speaking countries. As I desperately tried to unravel my host mother's words and distinguish her T's from her D's, she had to perform 10 repetitions of the above-mentioned speech act to simply ask me if I wanted a little bit of sausage and wanted to enjoy a bottle of Coke with her. So now you understand what that means, right, the, in, in dialect. So I think it's obvious, even in my subpar English rendering of Rebecca's text, how detailed and beautifully vivid um, this, this memory is for her. She uses sensory language to convey a strong emotional response to not understanding her host family. And she connects this time in her life, this cultural exchange, to sociolinguistic principles and constructs like variation and speech acts, um, which we had studied in the course. Now, in addition to disorienting dilemmas, 
Um, students' reflections also revealed emergent transformative moments, and that is moments when students reported seeing, acting, feeling, or learning differently. Here, Lucas, who's actually a native speaker of German from Austria, I had a few native speakers in the class, he wrote in his final reflection about gender neutral language, which he had learned about in his prior schooling in Austria, um, but reported that he had never really understood why it existed. So he wrote, again, this is a translation. Honestly, when my teachers first demanded gender equitable language at school, I was a bit annoyed. Up to that point, I've been using only masculine forms and have appreciated the simplicity of it. At that time, however, I was not aware of what effect genders have on sexual prejudice. On the one hand, I have this to my own fault, but on the other hand, I have to say that my teachers did not do a great job in explaining the reasons for promoting gender equitable language. If the teachers had explained to me a little more in detail what gender appropriate language um, uh, could have an effect, I would not have been surprised when we analyzed the reasons in more detail in this class. The class discussion helped me gain a new perspective on this topic. To be honest, I have to admit that I've never considered that because of our language usage. We associate certain sexes with, for example, certain occupations. The discussion in the class opened my eyes to this topic. The fact that we create stereotypes based on our language has made me think. Today, I find it almost a must to force students from an early age to write gender fairly. Only then can we fight against these stereotypes. So I think these examples show us how structured reflection can provide students with space to show and articulate for themselves meaningful connections between what's learned in the class and the experiences from beyond the classroom walls, potentially even leading to the transformation of particular beliefs and assumptions as this student reported in his, in his final reflection. So the final um, project I want to leave with you today is one that we started last spring in our German 101 classes at the University of Alabama. It's called the Perspectives Project in German simple translation, Perspektivenprojekt, and it involves embedding structured reflection in formal and informal ways. Um, embedding it namely into a series of communicative tasks known as integrated performance assessments. So if you're not familiar with IPAs, these are multitask assessments that reflect real world language use and are situated within a thematic unit. IPAs consist of three tasks, each addressing one communicative mode, interpretive, interpersonal, and presentational, and each task builds on the previous ones. In the IPA model, teachers provide continuous modeling and feedback loops as a type of formative assessment to allow students to evaluate their own abilities and development. And typically, as is the case for our lesson, IPAs begin with an interpretive task, which leads to an interpersonal, often speaking task that culminates in a presentational task, either written or spoken. So in our first semester German classes, students engage in four IPAs, four IPAs, uh, one per chapter. Each IPA begins with an interpretive task um, related to the Easy German video series. Does anyone know this, the Easy German, I'm sure, right? Yeah, and I think they're now Easy French and a lot of other ones, right? But I think it started with German, if I'm not mistaken. If you're not familiar with the series, it consists of interviews on the streets um, of cities in the German speaking world, mostly Berlin, that center around a particular topic up for discussion. There's always a range of perspectives on a given topic in the episodes, including second language learners of German who sometimes participate also in interviewing other people on the streets. Now, the second um, interpersonal communication task in each of these IPAs is a conversation that our 101 students have with first year graduate students who serve as German tutors before stepping into the classroom in their second year. This idea emerged last fall after hearing from disappointed graduate student tutors that few undergraduates were actually showing up to their open office hours. Maybe you have experienced that problem too. <laughs> so um, before the conversation takes place, but the conversation that the, the undergraduates have with the tutors, German 101 students must email the tutors in advance to set up a time to meet. This happens in German, so it's already an interpersonal communication activity, but it's, it's written communication. The conversations are then recorded and they're evaluated using an in-house rubric. This addition to the curriculum has had an important washback effect on our community of teachers and learners with students visiting the tutors on their own, not just to have these Gespräche, these conversations. Um, it's also providing our novice teachers with opportunities to practice communicating effectively and compassionately with beginning uh, learners of the language. 
So the final IPA is the presentational task. Um, this is an oral presentation that students do on their own or in groups initially over FLIP and then in class. And in line with the IPA models, um, students are asked to draw on material from the previous tasks, the, the Easy German video and um, their conversation with the graduate student um, to, and they, of course they can, they can include additional information, but those must be included. So IPAs um, typically end there with three tasks, um, but our IPA model uh, culminates in a reflection task in which students reflect in English on their learning experiences doing the chapter's IPA. So questions in the prompt, so I'll give you the prompt at least for the very first one, um, and this is in English. Uh, the questions in the prompt include, what new things did you learn through the last project set? How did your language grow, if at all? What new perspectives, if any, do you feel you engaged with? What new ideas or questions do you have now as they relate to the project? So as you can see by these questions, students are nudged to think about their learning in terms of new ideas and of course, new perspectives. I should point out that this is the only task as part of the IPA for which students receive a completion grade, not a letter grade, but we do give them feedback, of course. And in addition to, um, in addition to this reflection task for each of the four IPAs, reflection questions are built into each of the communicative tasks to give students an opportunity to reflect in the moment on the experience. So here you can see some um, examples following the video work. They're asked, um, and they do a lot of critical reading work with that um, or viewing work. Um, they're asked, what are some of the main takeaways for you about friendship in Germany from this video? That's for the third one that we do. Um, following the Gespräch, wie war das? What was, what was this conversation like? Um, feel free to note any thoughts about the experience in English um, um, or auf Deutsch. Um, this one, well, actually all of them. Well, let me read the last one and then I'll tell you a little bit about how this feeds into the reflection, the end reflection tasks. Um, Fazit, name two interesting things you and your group learned through this project in the final slide. Um, this can be an English, German, or a mixture of the two. Translanguaging is always welcome in these contexts of reflection. So um, I will say anecdotally, because we have not, we have not collected um, data yet, but this is something I plan to do next spring, very excited to see um, what the students do with this. But I have taught the course and I can say anecdotally that this sort of um, formative reflection that's built in, it's kind of its kind of in a sneaky way because they don't even realize that they're reflecting, I think in some ways, it ends up um, being drawn on for some of the students in their um, IPA reflection task. So I think it's helping them, it's priming them to think a bit about the experiences they're having and then get ready to think about any sort of perspective shifting um, that might be, um, that might occur. Um, the reflection embedded in this project serves the purpose of helping beginning language students to cultivate a reflective stance in the text, people, and activities that they engage with. And from a developmental standpoint, offering reflective moments like this should position students to be better prepared and ready at a later point in their language studies to process the unique experiences in learning other languages and living in other cultures. So I hope through this presentation to have shown you how one might begin to imagine and create pathways of perspective shifting and designing courses and curricula. I believe that we as language educators have significant roles to play in helping to guide and contribute to our students' overall development as they explore and develop greater open-mindedness about the world and themselves. Um, and I will end here with a picture of two of my favorite places, <laughs> Cornell and Hamburg. <laughs> Um, thank you all for being here, and I'm very happy to entertain any questions or comments that you have. Wonderful. Corey, thank you so much for this. I think this is giving all of us lots of ideas, um, lots of food for thought here. So as Corey said, let's open the floor for questions here. I don't know if anybody in the audience here has questions or on Zoom land. <laughs> Nothing on Zoom. Or comments, yeah. Mm -hmm or if you're doing similar things in your program. I would be interested in um, hearing a little bit more about target language use for this. So it sounds like at the advanced level, students are doing the reflections in German in your case. Yeah, right. Is there a place for reflection in the target language at an earlier stage? You know, for the sort of, well, there are a lot of different types of reflection. The sort that I'm talking about here where we're, we're giving students opportunities to look at value systems, big 
big ideas, abstract concepts, constructs. Um, I think it's difficult for them to do that. I don't. I just don't think they have the vocabulary, and it's also not the. It, it would be nice if we could do both promoting language learning and reflection. And there are probably some ways that that could happen in a smaller way. Um, maybe, for example, um, well, we we try to do a little bit of translanguaging, right? Like offering space for that. Um, the one time when I tried to do, uh, I made it an option to write reflections in German was in that. Um, low advanced grammar class uh, where students had written reflections about um, uh, questions they puzzles they had about German grammar and um, this the few students second language learners who had written um, in German they they just weren't as rich as the ones in English. So I think, you know, they're trade-offs and, and it depends on what the trade-offs, you know, how you view those trade-offs. Um, and I don't wanna make a judgment about somebody else's program. Um, for me, I think this is a nice supplement to what they're doing. It helps them process and it's process their experiences. Um, what I'm excited to do as I move forward in um, using more reflection in, in advanced levels is to understand the sort of reflection markers. I was talking about that with Gunhild earlier today with her class, um, the sort of discursive strategies that people use when they are reflecting. Um, I think that's really under, um, under researched. We actually don't know much about the genre of reflection or, and, or genres of reflection. And so I think that could actually be really helpful in helping students like scaffold basically the sort of thinking that we want them to do. Oh, hi, um, thank you very much for your very value um, um, talk. Um, that uh, reminded me of my um, advanced Korean class Ah. Um, that um, the one part of the advanced Korean class that we read a Korean novel that is a very well-known feminist novel in Korea. And then we read it um, like a chapter by chapter for two yeah. weeks. And mostly that um, I'm doing it like um, many years, about five years now, but um, that I remember most of the years that we had a very good discussion and then uh, we have very good like for, for example the for the like a, um the korean uh uh boys um they have like very uh like a, a anti uh feminism you know perspective they have like a kind of a change of their perspectives nice so it was really nice but you know, i remember that one year three years ago um, we had like a half and half, like a, um, the girls and boys. Yeah. And then the, those those students are from Korea. Um, and then they were born in Korea. Uh, and then they immigrated into America in, at a young age. And then still they have that kind of um, influence from their parents. Yeah. So their perspective is the kind of you know, very stereotyped, the, especially the boys. Yeah. And then when we read it, then boys didn't accept that this is the real and then they 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 just uh, complain that the, the novel is kind of exaggerating the you know situation that make the man very bad person, um, but you know actually that the girls will say no this is just like my mom's life, you know it's from the young age to the like older age the each stage of the life that the women's are you know, experiencing all the obstacles from the society and. And then we were talking about that, but you no, know, they were saying that they don't just uh, accept it. And there was kind of very tension, you know, in the yeah. discussion. And still, you know, at the end, they needed to submit the essay, what they learned and what they think about. Yeah. That. You know, they have very strong, you know, anti-feminist you know, opinion about that. But you know, logically, you know, they could, you know, work, um, write it very well. So you know, I was kind of a very, you know. I don't know, should I challenge them, you know, because yeah. as a teacher in the classroom, I need to um, like, uh, respect all those different, you know, perspectives. But, you know, even if I think that I really against their, you know, ideas, mm -hmm. but can I just, you know, like um, strongly express my uh, opinion and then just challenge them or just accept it as one of the variety of, you know, the perspectives, you know, the kind of very, you know, I, I, I was really struggling how to handle this. And then at the end, when I read there, I, I was hoping that they could, you know, um, 
like um, over the a lot of you know discussions from class discussions with the influence from the other you know girls in perspectives. Yeah, I was hoping that they they could change a little bit. Yeah, and at the end when I read their essays, you know, I was so much disappointed. Yeah, you know, so you know, I was thinking that uh, what I should do, what is my role as a teacher? You know, it was really challenging. For me. That that's an amazing story, and um, yeah, and I'm sorry, I I. I can imagine. I think some of us have had those experiences. It's a it's a type of dissonance that you're experiencing, right? And um, and you're seeing two frames of reference, maybe multiple frames of reference, not just binary, but maybe multiple ones that are coming in and clashing with each other. And um, and you're part of that too because you have you have opinions about about um, you, you have your own frame of reference. We all have our frames of reference, right? Um, so one thing I would say, just to, um, there are a few things I could say about this, but um, a hopeful way of looking at this is that um, perspective transformation uh, may happen at a later date for some of these individuals. It may not happen at all, right? But um, especially thinking about um, being open, not anti-feminist, <laughs> right? Th those sorts of perspectives, um, which don't reflect open-mindedness. I mean, that's something that could potentially shift and change. And in fact, that conversation, that whole semester and the, the powerful experience of reading that, that text and taught, and then the powerful experience of talking about that text, um, that, that may, that just may emerge later. And you probably unfortunately won't know about it unless someone contacts you at a later date. But um, it does it does happen, and that's one of the reasons why it's um, it's really hard to do this sort of research um, in with limited time. We were we had Angelica Gunhild and I had a conversation with Richard Kiley today about um, about transformative learning, and his dissertation was actually an eight year qualitative study looking at perspective transformation through um, in 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 uh, uh, study abroad contexts. So um, it's, I feel for you. <laughs> I don't know if that's, a, that's a, a good enough answer at this point. I guess in the moment, I'll say this one, one final thing about this. Um, I would go back to uh, Patricia Cranton. Of course, she's drawing on, she's drawing on Mesro's work, but those questions, I think questions are the way to go. I think when, you, when you're presented with complexity in the classroom, dissonance, um, it can be helpful. Oh, I had a lot of slides, sorry. <laughs> um, thinking about taking a step back and asking people to examine, maybe in the moment, maybe that's what needs to happen too. Why do you think that? I think the, the premise questions, we don't spend a lot of time on that because maybe they're too big. But in this case, the stakes are also really high, right? Because this is still lingering for you. This has staying power for you and thinking about that. And I there are episodes in my my teaching career that have staying power for me too. I wish I could go back and 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 think about those things or or have those conversations differently, or just wish that the outcome had been different. And actually, if I can jump in here real quick, this delayed effect reminds me of when Stacy Johnson was here, and she shared the one example of her student who was just completely dismissive of of any person with a Spanish background. And yeah. was actually angry, and then at the end of of a number of semesters, shared with her that you know I I have a different opinion now. So I, depending on what year this all happens, patience, right? Yeah, and St Stacy Stacy's written so much about transformative learning. Her her book um, on adult learning in the language classroom is amazing. Really, really good. To kind of follow up on on your point, and also to make some observations about your own students' reflections. When we, when we see these reflections, we see that there's a lot of storytelling happening with students. Yes. Right? You know, yeah. they're thinking, they're looking at the past and they're re-examining their past experiences and the assumptions that come with them. So potentially a powerful question can be to just invite students to, 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 to think about where, where did these ideas come from? What is it about my own lived experiences and my own socialization that that have me you know thinking in that way and it, it could be challenging but challenging the student but it's also just I hope like dialogue absolutely yeah a question that I have for you is is that 
it, it's when we think about assessment and and transform transformational learning, it's we often see it as as manifesting through students' writing. And so, do you think it's possible to have this sort of um, critical reflection happening through interaction and dialogue? And mm -hmm. do you have any ideas or strategies about that happening through classroom conversations when there are opportunities potentially to re-examine something from an assignment students have done and kind of really flip that? Yeah. Um, so structured reflection is a is a really large general cover term for all sorts of practices that are that appear in written or um, oral form uh, could also be mixed modality to or modes. Um, uh, I have my work has really been focused on written reflection, but some of the work that I've done with teachers on using structured written structured reflection indicates um, that they're using it um, also as a platform for further oral discussion in class about some of the issues that are coming up in this in students work. Um, uh, there's there's a lot out there. I, I don't have citations for you right now, but um, but certainly, yeah, class discussion would be a key thing. Also, um, maybe doing um, thinking about maybe the work from from simulations too. I think some of the debriefing happens sometimes orally. Um, probably experiential learning would be the place to go, um, where. Yeah, I'm even thinking back. I used to work at Concordia Language Villages um, and a lot of the debriefing, the reflective work with kids on some of the simulations we did happened. It always happened orally because kids didn't have patience. It was a summer camp. They didn't have patience to write. <laughs> we have one question from uh, one of our Japanese colleagues here on Zoom. Misa is asking, I agree that reflection makes students learning very meaningful in many ways, but could you please share an example or two that reflection helps students improve their linguistic skills or abilities or proficiency in the target language? Yeah, so one of the major insights from asking students um, about the value of doing structured reflection is that they, um, they could see their progress because they often wrote about their, their learning experience is what they were learning um, at, at the beginning levels, particularly for 101, where we were asking them to think about the German language and what does it mean to learn a language, they were using themselves as examples for that. And we know we were talking about this also earlier, um, the role of self-efficacy when, when students know that they um, or think that they are learning, it, it does translate into their ability to, um, to progress and, and learn. So there's probably more you could say, but the short answer to that question. Do we have other questions either on Zoom or here in the room? Please. Yeah, absolutely. So just getting back to the earlier question about how can we foster critical reflection in students at the beginning level? So this is just an idea that just popped into my head and I wonder yeah. what you think about it. What if there's an, a translation approach used where students encounter sort of a reflective text that incorporates vocabulary and grammar that's been, you know, taught in the classroom in English and students are asked to translate that into the target language. And so they see repetitions of the genre recurring potentially in the class. So working with translation as, oh, I think that's a great tool. Um, so. The person who could probably speak to that better than me is Carl Blythe, who's doing work on lingua culture, and um, he's actually a Cornell grad too, I think, <laughs> from yeah, graduate school, um, and looking at um, uh, very much in line with sort of Claire Cramch's work, um, how different constructs can look different in different or be perceived in different in different cultures. So yeah, I think there's so much that can be explored with, with translation. That might be something that works more at advanced levels though too. Um, and uh, particularly in situations where you have a lot of, um, a lot of material to draw onto. Like it could be even virtual exchanges, for example, conversations with other people. Oh, so relating to that, um, I think that you, know, you were, um, asking students to uh, write um, 
critical reflection like um regularly during uh, uh during the semester like four times of writing the journal yeah i think that is a really good way um for them to reflect what they've learned um then i think that maybe for the elementary level they are um responding in english but you know for the advanced level do you recommend them to do it in a target language yeah i think it would be yeah absolutely and i have a I do have a slide for this. Um, that's that's what Mike and I have been advocating in our curricular approach to thinking about how to stage reflection. So um, we we talk about it in terms of uh, well, first of all, there's a progression. The beginning levels you would want to think about getting students to explore their cultural frames of reference, um, identifying frames of reference. So the kind of what right the content. Um, reflection, learning about ways of being and interacting with, the, with each other. But then as they get um, to more advanced levels where they're reshaping their own cultural frames of reference and, and, and interrogating issues from multiple perspectives, they should be able to do the reflective work in the target language, just like I did with the sociolinguistics course. It was not easy for some of the students. Some of them were better at it too. I think maybe some students are um, have a better facility with um, doing reflective work to begin with. It's not easy to necessarily talk about your emotions and, and talk about things that you care about. For others, it's really easy. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Corey, again, for a very inspiring presentation. Thank, thank you. you, everybody, for joining us today. For those of you who are here, please make sure to enjoy the appetizers and the refreshments in the back. But please help me in thanking Corey for this wonderful talk. Thank you, Corey. Thank, Thank you for coming. <laughs>